Think about the last time you were at the mall with your child. You turned around, and your two-year-old was gone. You remember how that felt? Let me tell you this. You were lucky. Not every parent is so lucky. Consider that nightmare for a moment. What would happen to you? What would you do? My name is Brandon Perrin. I'm a private investigator. My investigative team is like an elite military unit. Working as a team, we take on the cases that law enforcement can't solve. Amy is an expert in criminal investigation. Alan is a child recovery expert. Darren is in charge of security. Monica is an undercover operative. Brad is a forensic specialist. Ray's expertise is in field investigations. We're solving America's crimes, and all the cases that we take on are real. We've got two new cases. Case file picks. This one's a murder charge. This is Mikey Hicks. He's 16 years old. This boy is facing life in prison for a crime that he says he did not commit. His trial starts in less than eight weeks. And his parents are asking for our help. Here's our second case, Carmichael. This is a missing kids case. Our client is Tim Carmichael. His two children have been abducted by his ex-wife. Lori Carmichael, 28 years old. She's got three warrants for her arrest. Here's who we're looking for. Dahlia Carmichael, age seven. And Gabriel Carmichael, four years old. Goes by Gabe. The kids were last seen with Lori in Chattanooga, Tennessee. These kids have been gone 283 days. We need to find them and bring them home. The nightmare that is happening to Tim Carmichael can happen to any one of us. His ex-wife took his kids and just left. He has no idea where she is. Tim Carmichael is like the all-American dad. Tim built his entire life around his children. That's why he does everything he does. It was for the future of his children. And now they've been taken away from him. Try to imagine what Tim Carmichael is going through. And the pain will overwhelm you. The last place the kids were seen is where we need to start. Chattanooga, Tennessee. How you doing, Brandon Parent, private investigator? Nice to meet you, Major Tim. Come in. Yes, come on in. Can you tell me what, what transpired, how it unfolded? My ex-wife, Lori Carmichael, and I divorced, and uh, we both had joint custody of the kids. After the divorce, Lori started to fall into some uh, drugs. She was taking LSD and was ranting to her friends about wanting to take the kids and go live in Costa Rica and live off fallen fruit. And a couple days later, you know, she did take off with the kids. Tell us a little bit about your kids. My daughter is named uh, Celestial Dahlia Carmichael. She goes by Dahlia. She's seven now. She was six at the time of, of the abduction. She's a very sweet and compassionate girl when she likes to look out for her brother a good bit. And uh, I love her to death, and she's, she's my angel. Both of my kids are, are the love of my life. Gabriel is four. He's just about one of the sweetest people you can meet. I miss, I miss the little things that you really take for granted. I miss things like hearing them run around the house. And, you know, my house is so quiet, and there are rooms to be so empty. And I miss everything about it. They could be anywhere. And they're with their mother. A mother who is on the run. A mother who has warrants out for her arrest. She's a fugitive. And from my experience, when you're on the run, 
You need a lifeline. Someone is helping her. We need to find out who it is. Tim told us that Lori spent a lot of time in a dive bar in downtown Chattanooga. So that's our best lead right now. In a case like this, going undercover may be the only way we're going to get information that we need. Everybody's got their uh, briefing document, correct? Tonight, we're going to be going to our first insertion for the uh, undercover operation, OK? I want to go through this by the numbers. Red team, Amy and Monica, you guys are all set. And then surveillance and security, Brad, Darren, and Mark. Basically, target address is going to be a bar called The Watering Hole. This place is run by Mary. Mary was a best friend, confidant, and former employer of Lori, our prime target, the mother who's taking the children, OK? Let me tell you what's going on here, what the thing about tonight is. The bomb's being dropped, OK? We have a $10,000 reward out. There's a reward poster. The father, he's going into the bar. He's going to start handing out the posters, posting it on the wall. It's going to create a buzz. I want you guys already in there when the buzz starts. I want you to play drunk and loose, and you got it. Work them. If you see a stir over any people over it, they're talking about the posters, I want you to get close to hear what they're saying. If anybody's trying to make a call because they want to warn Lori in any respect, or someone who knows Lori, I want you to make note someone's making a call. You're all pros. You know what to do. It gets stupid in there. Get out. It's coming up on our left. Coming up. We just entered the zone. Blue team, break off. We know this bar is a hangout for drug dealers. We got a green light. Enter. It's a dangerous place, and whenever you go in undercover, there's an element of risk. Roger that, standing. But when you're trying to get information from the people who may be protecting the person you're looking for, they're not just going to give it to you. Amy and Monica are undercover specialists. They are great at fitting in anywhere and getting people to open up. Command one to B1. Male walking through the parking lot, checkered black and white jacket. Drug dealer. He's up to no good for sure. I can't see anything. Die copy. Standing by. C1 to B1. The posters are on their way. The posters are on their way. Uh, I can see the whole area. Tim is entering the bar with the posters. He's going to start handing them out. Hi, my name is Tim Carmichael, and I'm out to recover my kids. Um, my ex-wife, she's taken off. So. I'm Tim Carmichael. Have you seen that girl on the poster? Didn't she used to work here? Boom. Uh, uh, she, she does travel, uh, travel with like, the Rainbow family and stuff, and I know they do an annual gathering in Ocala. What's the Rainbow family? A bunch of hippies that can't help you. It's a very easy place for people to hide from society. Right, right. Come on, hurry. That guy's like freaking me out. That undercover operation led to our first big break in the case. We have some huge information. We talked to Mary. Mary told us that Lord is traveling with the Rainbow family, and there's a big gathering coming up in Ocala, Florida. We're going to have to infiltrate that gathering. Excellent. Thanks. Every year, more than 800,000 kids are reported missing. Tim Carmichael's kids, Dahlia, age 7, and Gabe, age 4, they've been missing for almost a year. They've been abducted by their mother, Lori Carmichael. Alan Cardoza is a child recovery specialist, and I brought him in to help us try and crack this case. Our undercover operation in Tennessee revealed that Lori is traveling with a group known as the Rainbows. According to one of our sources from the undercover operation, there's an upcoming rainbow gathering in Ocala, Florida. This can be a dangerous mission. We have found out that Lori is using an alias of Spring so that's who we're looking for. You guys are here for one reason. You're hunters, and she's our prey. And we're going to hunt her down on her own territory. Let's bring these kids home. All right, guys, we're headed to the Ocala National Forest. You uncovered information that leads us to believe that Lori and the kids are going to be at this gathering. As soon as we hit those woods, you're hippies. We're going to hike in and become one of them, and we're going to try and find her. Once we're in, we're in. We're going to be undercover, contacting people directly, trying to find Lori and the kids. Girls, you need to stay close to me, OK? You will never be left outside my sight. You're going to see some guys out here that are predators, all right? If there's a problem, you go directly to me. Just keep the cover going, keep it cool, and do your job, and we should be fine. Hey, do you guys know a girl named 
Spring. Mm -hmm. I know there's somebody named River. River, yeah. You know what? We're looking for one of my girlfriends. Have you guys seen Spring? I don't know who that is. Hey, do you guys know a girl named Spring? No. No. All right, thank you. Love you. Have you seen Spring? Um, I can't remember. I saw so many people this morning. Like 150, 200 people that I knew for a long time. Show him that picture of her. Yeah, I think that's her. Well, yeah, I'm going to... Yeah. Oh, that's her. Yeah. Now that I looked at the picture, I think I saw her today. Were the kids with her? Yeah. They were? What'd you find out? He knows her from all the gatherings, and he thinks he might have seen her today. Are you serious? He said he saw her? She was carrying all her stuff in a wagon. What about the kids? She had her two kids with her. And he says she'll be camping out at Kitty Village. This is huge. We got surveillance points set up. She's not getting out of this forest if you find her here. So get aggressive. We need to make it happen. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Under 50, 200 people by the fire. No way to identify their faces from here. One of the problems is so many of these women look alike. We're going to have to get in a lot closer. We're going to have to go one-on-one -on -one to get anything done. Just go around the circle asking, hey, I'm looking for my friend Spring. Anybody see her? Spring, Spring, it's so dark. Just play it. I can't see anything out here. If somebody asks, they see her. They oh, where is she? Describe her. Just engage in conversation. Work it hard. Okay. Work it fast. Don't stop and socialize. And I'm not here to make friends. Okay, we're here to find Lori and the kids. Hey, you guys, have you seen a girl named Spring? circle the whole time. I didn't see anybody that even looks like her. I ID to all possible tattoos, everything. They're yelling her name. Yeah. And there no one bites. No one said, yes, I'm screaming. Yeah, nobody. She's not here. We have to consider what we have so far, okay? This place is huge. It's overwhelming, to be honest. When we came in here, we knew the difficulties would be uh, extreme, and they're even more extreme than I thought they would be. We have more resources on the ground in this investigation than most investigations have. We still don't have enough. They still have to travel. They still have to stop at gas stations. They still have to interact with the rest of America. Somebody's close enough to her that they're going to give us something. It's not over. We need an army, you know? We need an army. I have two kids, just like Tim. What if those were my kids? Every day that man goes without his kids. It puts a hole in my own heart as I think what it would be like to live without my own. And I know that's something I just would be unable to bear. Hello, Tim. I wish I was able to call in some better news, but unfortunately we came up empty. It was a promising lead, but sometimes these things just don't pan out. We're still on this. We're not giving up. It's a long road we're traveling here, and we're going to give it our all. We're still coordinating in our efforts with law enforcement, missing children's organizations. Hang in there, all right? Let's cut wrench. Where do we go next? What do we do next? Because every minute that goes by is another minute that these kids are in danger. We're coordinating again with law enforcement, FBI, state law enforcement agencies, and local law enforcement agencies. We need some ideas. We need to start thinking way outside the box. There are also rainbow communes all over the country. We've documented about 20 of them so far. We know that there are some in California, Tennessee, in Georgia, Michigan, in Oregon, and the next gathering is in two weeks in Alabama. The fact is, the longer these kids are missing, the less chance there is that they're going to get found. Brandon, this is Tim Carmichael. I, I just got a call from the state police out in California, and they found the kids. Um, someone called in a, a tip after seeing the missing kids poster. 
They've arrested Lori and the kids are in custody, so I'm on my way to California right now. Give me a call as soon as you get this. You ready? Stop. You've been ready for this for 10 months, I'll bet. Okay. I think they're in here. Right here, buddy. Ready? Ah. Oh. Your daughter. <laughs> You're always in my heart. I miss you so much, baby. <laughs> Look at that hair, dude. Wow. I <laughs> got That's awesome. I miss you so much. No mommy's gonna have me for that long. I miss you so much, Gabriel. I love you so much. Big hug. Mm -hmm. You look different. Do I? Yes. Well, you look different too with all, this, all these <laughs> nappies in your hair. Good friend. You too. I knew you would be taller than your sister by now. <laughs> seven and a half. Being in my old You are. Hair. You're seven and you're four. And you know what? Happy birthday to I both of you guys. Because I miss both of your birthdays. I want a half. This is Mikey Hicks, 16 years old. This boy is facing life in prison for a crime that he says he did not commit. And his parents are asking for our help. Here's what we know so far. Five teenagers have been arrested in the murder of a Fort Pierce man. They are facing homicide and robbery charges in connection with the beating death of Julio Paxtor. Paxtor was found dead near the intersection of Okeechobee Road and South 27th Street in Fort Pierce a week ago. According to police reports, Julio Paxtori was riding his bicycle home one night when he was attacked and brutally beaten to death. This is a recording of the 911 call. 911, police are arrested. Oh, no. yes. Based on that 911 call, we know that this murder was committed before 9.37 p.m. Five people were arrested for the crime, including Mikey Hicks. All four of these guys confessed to the police. The police interrogated Mikey and they tried every trick in the book, but Mikey stuck to his story. He says he was babysitting his nephew, Tyler, that whole night and he had nothing to do with it. Right now, that's Mikey's alibi. He says he was babysitting. We were able to secure a copy of the police interrogation video from Mikey's lawyer. What were you doing last week? Friday, just uh, babysitting. Babysitting? Yeah. They told us what happened. They're trying to pin everything on you. They said you were there. You were there, okay? I wasn't there. Then why are you half a dozen people who were driving by say that they were four blocks away guys and a white guy stomping on the Mexican guy. Four black guys and a white guy. Uh, yeah. According to the police, eyewitnesses say they saw four black males and one white guy at the scene. Here's our biggest problem. All of these guys know Mikey from the neighborhood. All four of these guys say that Mikey was with them at the time of the murder. It doesn't look good for Mikey. I'm gonna go meet with his parents. Start reviewing the police reports to see if there's anything we can use. Something that can lead to the truth. The chances of clearing a person who has been charged with first degree murder in the United States is almost, you got a better chance of winning the lottery having never bought a ticket. Mikey Hicks is in big trouble. 
the state would not have filed first-degree murder charges unless they believed the evidence was there. After 20 years as a private investigator, you learn to follow your gut. And something is telling me that this 16-year-old kid is not guilty. Whether or not we can prove it is an entirely different question. Mr. Hicks? Yes. Brandon Parent, private Hi, investigator. How are, how are you? When did you first learn that he had been arrested? Can you tell me what, what transpired, how it unfolded? My daughter called here, hysterical. Your daughter and what's your daughter's name? Uh, Angela. What did you do after you got oh, off the phone with her? We immediately got in the phone, uh, got in a truck and uh, went to the police department. A detective came out and told us our son was... He told us he was being charged with a homicide. I couldn't believe it. It's a nightmare. Is he scared? Oh, God. Yes. He is mortified. Does he understand that there's a possibility he could spend the rest of his life in there? Yes, he does understand that. I mean, he thinks, as his father, I'm supposed to be able to snap my finger and fix it, make it go away. I'm not losing my son. I can't. Not for something he didn't do. What's he like normally? He eats, sleeps, drinks, baseball. He had, very, he had even been offered scholarship. He was offered college scholarships? His whole life is probably ruined. <laughs> this is how sentimental my son is. Mom, I know there are times when I forget to say thanks or I love you. But there's never a time that I don't feel proud and grateful to have such a wonderful person to call my mom. This is in his hand. <laughs> mom, I just want to say thank you for everything you do. I love you very much. Love always. Mikey. That's why you got to help us. It's a good kid. I can't work. We don't sleep at night. You know, we... I can't sit down and eat a decent meal because I, I know my son is not getting decent meals. His whole life is turned completely upside down. And how do you get that back? You fight for it. If he's innocent, I'm gonna bring him home. I promise you that. Thank you. Can you imagine someone you love getting arrested, thrown in jail, and accused of a crime he swears he didn't commit? Mikey's 16 years old. He's supposed to be in school, doing homework and playing baseball. Not in jail without bail on a first-degree murder charge. He's been in there for more than three months. And right now, there's absolutely nothing his parents can do about it. Oh, Uncle Mikey. Well, I want to see him. I know you want to see him, baby. If that was your son, and he was really innocent, how would that make you feel? Mikey, how you doing? Brandon Parent. All right, Mikey, as you know, Brandon Parent has been hired to assist me on your case and to prove your innocence. I've reviewed the initial police reports, but I want to tell you, it looks bad. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I want to know from you, and I want you to be honest with me, regarding the beating death of Julio Pastore on August 19th, were you part of that? No, I was not a part of that. Where were you at that, that night? I was at my sister's house. Between the hours of 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, you're telling me you were at your sister's house? Yes, sir. What's it like in here? It's nowhere I want to be. My mom, she just, she cries every day, every time I talk to her. And my dad, he's, he's a man, he don't want to cry, but 
He does. Makes me hurt, cause never seen my dad this this emotional. He's never been one to really cry. But every time I talk to him, he just he can't help but cry. Wish I could hug him. Seems like there's a big dragon out there breathing fire on you right now, huh? Consider me your dragon slayer. Yes, sir. I've been an investigator for 20 years. You know, we're here defending the Constitution. That's what we're about. And the Constitution was written by our forefathers with the sole, sole intention of protecting citizens. From who? Foreign powers? No. From Al-Qaeda? No. The Constitution was written to protect its citizens from the government. That's what it was written for. Mikey Hicks is 16 years old, and he's accused of a crime that he says he did not commit. Mikey has an alibi. He says that he was babysitting his nephew, Tyler, on the night of the murder. Where were you at that, that night? I was at my sister's house. The murder occurred sometime before 9.37 p.m. The big question is, what time was Mikey babysitting? Tyler is too young to testify in a trial, but Mikey's sister Angela may be a key witness in this case. Hi, Angela. Hello. Hi, Brandon Perrin, private investigator. So when is the first time you saw Mikey that day? Um, probably like 4 or 5. So around 4 or 5 o'clock, he arrived here at your apartment. You were home? Yeah, with him. And your son was home? And I don't have to be to work until 10 and 11. You were getting ready to leave to go to work? To go to work. Okay. And this was about? Like 10.30. So you think you left here around 10.30? Yeah. That's key. I was getting ready to leave, and I walked out the door. I got, like, three steps out the door, and four boys started walking up the stairs. I, I know that one of them's name was Harris. That's the one that I did know his name. I've seen all four of them before, but I never... Could you show me just, uh, um, if you could, real quick? I got about, like, right here. You could see them walking. Okay, this is a for me. Okay, kiddo? Yeah. You saw them coming from where? They were coming there, walking up the stairs, and they got up there, and I'm like, nope, but I was already walking down told him nobody's allowed to be in the house. They live around here somewhere. I don't know exactly where they live, but I know it's somewhere around here because I see them all the time. Okay. And you said no? No, I told him no. I was like, nobody can come over. I have to go to work. And then you left? Yep. You left and you drove towards? Riverside. And I went to work, and right in front of AutoZone, there was, like, tons of cop cars, ambulance, and they were they had a crime scene with the yellow tape. You would travel past the crime scene? Did you know what it was at the time? No, I didn't even know anything. I, you I, said you thought that... I saw that the man was hit by a car. I didn't even know that it was a killing. And up until approximately five minutes before that, you were with your brother the entire night, correct? But it doesn't take five minutes. Not even five minutes? Is your brother a member of a gang? <laughs> no. Why are you laughing? Because he goes to school, he plays baseball. Would you lie for him under oath? No. You wouldn't. And one of the questions that a jury is going to ask... I know if he wasn't here, then I wouldn't. I'm not going to risk his life to tell a lie. You're not going to jeopardize your son's, son's life, life lie. to lie for your brother, but you are absolutely certain. He was here with you and your, your son 5 o'clock p.m. till approximately 10.30 p.m., correct? Oh, definitely. You will swear under oath he was here with you and your son. He was here, definitely. According to Angela, he knows these guys. They're neighborhood kids. He actually came by to see him after they committed the crime. How do we know that? Angela's walking out the door, going to work. This is about 10 o'clock or so, okay? The crime had already been committed. She's walking down the stairs, and these guys are coming up. She, Angela gets in her car. She drives to work. On her way to work, she has to pass the crime scene. This was after the crime. Mikey wasn't there. I feel good about this. I feel real good about this. What we now know is that it's a good alibi. It's solid. Of course, we have a problem. It's a great alibi, but it's a sister. She's not strong enough. 
There's a lot of problems still with this case. Why would these four co-defendants name him? It doesn't make sense. Why? This is the big question. Why would the other four defendants say Mikey Hicks was there if he wasn't? I think they're lying. They're known gang members, and I think they're trying to protect one of their own. We gotta prove it. We have an alibi, but we need evidence to solve this case. I want a strategy here. I want a plan of action. Brad, you're without question a forensic guy. I want to know if there's any blood evidence here, what kind of questions we can raise in respect to blood evidence and, and forensic issues. What can you see at that time of night? Uh, how's the lighting? We've got lighting issues as far as on the street. That's going to be your job. Check that out. And I want photographs. I want diagrams. I want comparisons of that scene to what the police are submitting as their examination of the scene. And while we're there, the same time we plan for the crime scene, let's do double duty. I want a canvassing prepared. Ray and Amy put that together. The fact is, it's a predominantly black neighborhood. So, I mean, we need to go in there and realize that it's a black neighborhood. Ray, you're going to be our lead on that. You're our ambassador in that respect. We got to let them know we're there. When we go out there with a lot of investigators banging on doors and talking to people, stopping them in the street, other neighbors are going to see what's going on. That's going to make them talk. We need a buzz. So I want to plan for that. If we could have any kind of break of identifying an actual eyewitness, that'd be wonderful. But let's be realistic here. This family, the Hicks family, has entrusted us with the freedom and the life of their son. They are relying on us. I don't want any excuses. I want the eye on the ball. We've got to get this kid out of this. Let's go. Am I an underdog? The government, the prosecutor, law enforcement, the judicial system, that's Goliath. I'm David. They want to put Mikey Hicks in prison for the rest of his life. I want the truth to be told. I wasn't there. There were half a dozen people who were driving by saying that there were four black guys and a white guy stomping on the Mexican guy. I'm an old school investigator. Sometimes you have to hit the streets and start knocking on doors. We're going to start working that way. I'm a private investigator. I'll uh, hear uh, talk about a murder that happened back in the neighborhood a couple months ago. Oh, I don't know that. Does that ring a bell? No? Thank you. It's, it's important for us to, uh, to get anybody who might have seen or not seen anything that night. All right, thank you very much. Have you ever talked to anybody who might have seen something or seen a group of guys, boys running? Nah, nah. We wonder if we might have been around that night. That's all. Oh, just, uh... The biggest problem we have is getting the trust of people to speak to us. You know what I mean? They don't want to. They don't want to communicate anything. Well, let me introduce you, Barbara. This is Brandon. Hi. How you doing, Barbara? Hey. Nice to meet you, Brandon. Sir. She was. She saw the incident in question, and she saw five black men. Oh wow. And she was driving with her baby's daddy, and they saw it happening. Summer. She saw everything. What she did was when she turned the corner, uh, the guys were standing over there. There was two guys that were actually beating the guy. There was three guys that actually looked like a lookout. He said that guy, and I made sure. I said, okay. Describe them. Were they black? Yes. Okay. That is huge. She saw him even to the fact the way he covered himself up, where they beat him and he covered up on the ground. Really? Yeah, I just seen him dropping, but when I asked my when I asked my baby daddy, I said, what them boys doing to that man? He said that they just had punched him and knocked him out. So you were here? Yeah, because when I looked over and I seen I seen when they was beating him and I seen the man fall down. And you're sure that you saw five black males? Yeah. Well, that's big. Brandon, how you doing? Listen, just got a break in the case. This is something the police don't know about someone they don't know about. I mean, this is unbelievable. We found the witness who actually observed the murder itself. And she says she saw five guys and all of them were black. But during the interrogation, the police told Mikey that they had witnesses who said they saw a white guy at the scene of the crime. Yeah. There's something not right here, and we need to get to the bottom of this. You've got to focus on this in your deposition with the police detective who interrogated Mikey. say that we love you, we love you, we love you. No, love y'all too. 
We know you do. Son, I won't stop till you're home. You hear me? Yeah. 60 seconds left on this call. Well, listen, baby, but you know how we hate for this to hang up on us. Yeah. So Hello. anyways, you know that we love you, Mike. I know. Love y'all, too. Bye, Bye Mikey. Mikey. Bye. Bye, Bye honey. You gotta keep telling yourself it's gonna be okay. Okay? <laughs> Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Would you state your occupation? Detective, work this police department. You're the lead detective in the case against State of Florida versus Mikey Hicks. Yes, sir. Did anyone, either police or civilian, come up to you as a lead detective and tell you that a white boy was part of this crime or part of the gang that they saw chasing anyone? Let me check my report here. Nothing. Yes. Did you have any information that, in fact, a white person may have been involved in this attack? No, sir. What was the description of the suspects that night? I believe it was five black males walking together. I was not there. Then why are you? Why did half a dozen people who were driving by say that there were four black guys and a white guy stomping on a Mexican? Four black guys and a white guy. Uh, yeah. In your interviews with Mr. Hicks, did you ever tell him that there were eyewitnesses that put him at the scene and that was not true at the time, right? Uh, yes, sir. I believe so. Not true today either. No, sir. Can you tell me in your own words what evidence is there that links Mikey Hicks to this murder? Uh, statements from the other suspects involved in the incident. And that's it? That's it. Is there any physical evidence that links him to this crime? No, sir. Any fingerprints, blood uh, on any items of his clothing, his person? No, sir. Trace evidence of any nature? No, sir. So the case rises or falls on the uh, word of the code of fence? Yes, sir. No further questions. It's two weeks until trial on the Hicks case. We've got a solid alibi. You will swear under oath he was here with you and your son. He was here, definitely. We've got an eyewitness who says Mikey wasn't there. I seen when they was beating him and I seen the man fall down. And you're sure that you saw five black males? Yeah. Well, that's big. And the lead detective on the case admitted that he lied to Mikey during the interrogation. Did you ever tell him that there were eyewitnesses that put him at the scene and that was not true at the time, right? Uh, yes, sir, I believe so. Not true today either. No, sir. Right. The only thing left against Mikey is that all four co-defendants claim he was with them at the time of the crime. Guys, gather around. I got something big. We just got a huge break in this case. I have believed that those four co-defendants were lying that they were incriminating Mikey Hicks because they were protecting a friend, a fellow gang member. I couldn't believe that all four were gonna stick to this lie. Through confidential sources, I was able to get a letter from one of the co-defense to whom it may concern. There's an inmate at the St. Lucie County Jail that shouldn't be here. His name is Michael Hicks. He is in here for something he had nothing to do with. Signed. Kinwin Taylor. <laughs> did it again. You did it. Amy, this evidence needs to get the defense counsel. Mikey's attorney needs this. This is life or death stuff. Let's get things rolling. I'm Richard Kibbe, and appreciate everybody coming here. The senseless and tragic death of Julio Pexatori was a sad day in St. Lucie County back in August when he was pulled from his bike and brutally stomped to death. And the police, in an urgent move to try to find the culprits of that senseless, brutal slaying, arrested somebody that should not have been arrested, an innocent young boy, 16 years old. We were looking at a trial here within about two weeks. 
today. The state decided to drop all the charges against Michael Hicks. Oh, God, son. I told you this day would come. Come on, let's go home, baby. Fighting for justice is a struggle. But when you get to reunite a family, it makes it all worthwhile. At that moment, you are a hero to someone. Mikey Hicks spent over 150 days in jail for a crime that he didn't commit. Mikey and his family are trying to put their lives back together. Dahlia and Gabe Carmichael were missing for 324 days. They are living at home once again with their father in Chattanooga, Tennessee. <laughs> 